Welcome to Disaffected. I'm Joshua Slocum, and this is the show where we talk about culture, politics, and relationships through a psychological lens. I want to start out with a little viewer mail, listener mail, this week. This is from Fred in Europe, and here's what Fred has to say. I just listened to your interview with Benjamin Boyce. Um, you remember that, the Boyce of Reason podcast that I recommended last week. Um, I've also seen the exact same dynamic between narcissists, cults, and social justice warriors. I had no idea someone else was working on it. Well, someone else is, and it's just as happy to me, Fred, that you are working on it yourself. I love to see people waking up to this. There's more of us out there, folks, than you think. Back to Fred. I'm sort of in the niche of the healing after narcissists space whether using therapy tools or emotion work. In this space, there are many social justice warriors who have been groomed and abused. I can't call out directly the link as you do, so I focus on highlighting the mechanisms and behaviors and write many tweets trying to show people patterns. Often when I write about narcissists, I'm actually thinking of the woke people. I have a theory about how the wokies operate. I call it contracted, rationalized trauma. Here's the short version. Someone gets abused. For example, a little girl has a shitty dad. Instead of healing their trauma, they rationalize it. And one way they do that might be to say, all men are evil because it's not possible that my dad was crap. This theory contains the seeds of the trauma. Others embrace the ideas and get contaminated by the trauma. They, con they contract the rationalized trauma, possibly because it echoes to some extent with their own pain. Best wishes from Europe, Fred. Thank you, Fred. Best wishes from the US. I like this idea of contracted, rationalized trauma uh, because it, it takes account of a couple of dynamics that I, I think Fred is right about. The extrapolation, the excessive extrapolation from our own experiences into how we see the world and how we categorize other people. And the other part that it takes account of is the social contagion. And I think we all see that social contagion happen in activist spaces. Right now, we're seeing it on the social justice left and in the mainstream left, but it isn't as if this doesn't happen across the political spectrum. It absolutely does. I think we're in an era right now where this is the, this acute problem is coming from the left. I think we are seeing more of this type of behavior, cult-like behavior, personality disorder type behavior, and, and, and the behavior that normal people engage in when they're in the orbit of somebody with a cluster B personality disorder. But you see it across the political spectrum, and there will come a time when this pendulum will shift. It'll go back the other way, and we're going to be seeing this more on the right. So I think that all of us, and especially including people like me, need to keep our ears and eyes open and attuned to those shifts so that we don't lull ourselves into thinking that once we've found the one answer to this, that that one answer is going to stay the same across time, because it probably isn't going to stay the same. But I think I see what Fred calls contracted, rationalized trauma um, among many self-described feminists, whether they're radical feminists or, or if they describe themselves as other kinds of feminists. It's, you, you see it in, I had a conversation once. I had a conversation once with a friend. I've had this conversation more than one time, but I remember this particular one. We were talking about, we were looking at, at cluster B behavior, right? Typical traits of people who are excessively narcissistic, especially emotionally unstable. And you could boil this down, if you're going to look at it in a stereotype sort of generalized way, this isn't going to apply to everything, but, but it's a decent generalization. If you boil down the core traits that characterize both narcissistic personality disorder and borderline personality disorder, to a close approximation, those character types look like the stereotypes of what goes wrong with men and what goes wrong with women. So 
the narcissistic personality disorder case often looks like our stereotyped image of the abusive, aggressive man, the guy who never shuts up, the guy who talks over any women in his life, the controlling boyfriend who monitors where you go, the person who lashes out in anger if you disagree or disobey. And the same thing can be said of borderline personality disorder. The stereotype of the of the woman gone wrong, right? The bitch, the hot and cold, the I hate you, don't leave me, the manipulative coquettish behavior that turns into anger and snarling within a few minutes. That's the stereotype of the crazy chick, right? Neither of these things, narcissistic PD or borderline PD, is an accurate description of what men in general are like or what women in general are like. That's not true. Most people aren't like this, thankfully. But they are fairly accurate descriptions of what people <laughs> with narcissistic personality disorder look like and borderline personality disorder when men and women hew to the, the normative sex-based expressions. You will find men who who go wrong in ways that look more like borderline personality disorder might look more typically female, and you will find women who go wrong in ways that look more typically male or more narcissistic personality disorder typical. But in general, these things do tend to correlate pretty strongly along sex lines. And I think the mistake that both feminists make, but that men and I don't know what the counterpart is in men. You could say men's rights activists or men who call themselves men going their own way. They're, as I've reconsidered some of these things, um, there's certain I see the toxicity in the men who describe themselves as men's rights activists. I think that it gives a cover to a lot of genuine misogynists. But I don't think it's all misogyny, and I don't think they're all like that. I'm not as conversant with it as as I could be, but as I've reevaluated some groups of people and some lines of thought that I did not give consideration to before, my stereotyped ideas of who these people are are a little more complicated. Um, but you see women, especially feminist activists, who talk about male typical abuse, male typical violence, and, and what they describe when they describe these behaviors, you know, they are correctly describing abusive, controlling, sinister behaviors, and sometimes behaviors that look like they come from a personality that has the dark triad traits, the sadism, the Machiavellianism. Uh, I always forget the third one. Is it narcissism or is it is it something psychopathic? I can't even remember. I can't believe that. But on the flip side, when you see men describing women like this, men's rights activists or men going their own way, they are also sometimes describing what looks like typically female toxic behavior of women who have borderline slash histrionic personality disorder or a high dose of those traits. And I think the mistake that both of these groups make is saying this is what men are like and this is what women are like. No, it isn't. It's what people with personality disorders or a surfeit of personality disorder traits look like typically when you sort them by sex. So it's narcissistic PD flavor male typical or borderline personality disorder flavor female typical. So Fred, thanks. That's that's a great way to um, to look at this, and uh, I appreciate that. Contracted, rationalized trauma. I want to remind you, um, especially those of you who are watching us right now on our live premiere on YouTube, and if you don't watch our live premiere on YouTube and you want to see what the show looks like and you want to join in with, uh, with the live chat, we go live on YouTube every Sunday at 9. But subscribe to us on audio. We're also an audio podcast, and we are great to take along in the car. You can find us anywhere you get podcasts. We're on iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, Google Podcasts, iTunes, anywhere you look. So find us on audio, and please, please hit that subscribe button. I want to go back to something we talked about a couple of weeks ago with the Centers for Disease Control, which, of course, is so much more than the Centers for Disease Control today, isn't it? There are 
our landlord tenant contract negotiators. Uh, they're also our language police. They um, uh, and now now they're going to be apparently joined by OSHA. Uh, as President Biden has expanded the powers of executive agencies and civil service agencies, now OSHA uh, will ostensibly be enforcing Joe Biden's vaccine mandate in private businesses, although I'm happy to say it looks like about at least 27 Republican governors have um, said that they're going to take this to court. Well, we talked about the CDC, excuse me momentarily, <clears throat> we talked about the CDC putting out their new inclusive communication guide where they gave us substitute words for all the bad words that we shouldn't say anymore for people with disabilities or people who are homeless. So as a reminder of what we talked about, I'll put up one of the graphics we used. They have a little chart where they talk about current words and what they'd like to substitute um, in a more inclusive way. So with disability, we have Instead of disabled, differently abled, afflicted, handicapped, or wheelchair bound, we have a list of try this suggestions for different words. So instead of disabled, we talk about people with disabilities or people with a disability. Instead of confined to a wheelchair or wheelchair bound, we have people who use a wheelchair or a mobility device. There's that concept of person first language again, which I know some of these people some of them actually mean well. They really do. They're misguided, but they mean well. But, but this is just hokey shit, folks. So where is this coming from? Why is the CDC doing this? And the CDC isn't the only one doing this, right? You've seen a lot of agencies, government agencies, that seem to take changing your language and wokeifying everything as their primary objective rather than the mission that they were created for. Well, there was an article in the paper, the Washington Free Beacon, which went some way to explaining this, and it's not surprising. This is ideological capture from out, outside organizations. And some of it is what I would call cluster B capture. Not all of it. I don't know the dynamics in all of these nonprofits that end up doing in-services and, and writing guides for government agencies, but I do know the nonprofit sector. And from experience, I do know that this sector attracts a lot of disturbed personalities. People who are, uh, if not outright personality disordered, are vulnerable to the manipulations of people who present themselves as heroes or as saviors when they're really doing it for self-regarding reasons. So let me read to you a little bit from this Free Beacon story. It might seem odd for the CDC to be ironing out the finer points of woke vernacular while COVID-19 is killing over a thousand Americans each day. Oh, I can't, I'm sorry, but that it isn't. Back to the story. <laughs> but the agency wasn't starting from scratch. Rather, its guidance drew on a network of nonprofits that are institutionalizing progressivism as public health's lingua franca. The guide's preferred terms for gender, for example, come straight from the LGBT activist group GLAAD, which is the gay and lesbian anti, now I can't even remember what it is, GLAAD, G-L-A-A-D. I'm gonna have to take better notes. Well, you all have Google. Come straight from the LGBT activist group GLAAD, whose media reference guide says phrases like biologically male are problematic and reductive. And the CDC's health equity lens takes inspiration from a report by the Racial Equity Institute. Notice that, folks, not equality, equity, which is listed at the end of the guide as, quote, an explanation about the root causes of racism and racial inequity. The report urges policymakers to, quote, Confront the reality that all our systems, institutions, and outcomes emanate from the racial hierarchy on which the United States was built, and denies that any inequalities are caused by people's culture or behavior. Yeah, interesting. No unequal outcomes happen because of people's behavior. None of them happen because of the personal choices that people make. Nothing bad that happens to them is because they were irresponsible 
or they expected too much and didn't want to put in the work. It's all because of the racial hierarchy on which the United States was built. This is the idea that it's all systemic bias, systemic racism, systemic transphobia, systemic misogyny. Because we're not allowed to talk about the fact that some cultures and some subcultures are worse than others in terms of outcomes for health and economic success, and some of them are. What are some of those cultures? Single parent household culture, high school dropout culture, what I call poverty culture in the poor white working class, like what I came from, very different from working class culture. There's nothing necessarily pathological about being working class. Poverty culture is different. Poverty culture is the idea that the way to succeed in life is that every generation that comes along in your family, when they turn 18, you take them down to the welfare and Medicaid office and get them into the system. Um, let's go back to the story for a couple more. Reached for comment, the CDC said that its link to the report did not, quote, constitute an endorsement. Mm, that's weak. The guide is the latest illustration of how progressive nonprofits capture public health agencies through a kind of technocratic activism, burrowing their ideology into medical language by framing social controversies as settled scientific fact. Government officials like those at the CDC then cite those activists alongside professional health associations, many of which have gone woke themselves. That boosts the activist's credibility while undermining the government's own. The CDC may be insulated from certain kinds of political pressure, but it is hardly immune to the ideological contagion of medical nonprofits. And here's, here's the closer, and this, this is what really clinches it. Further eroding that immunity is the revolving door between these nonprofits and the Centers for Disease Control. The Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, for example, appears three times in the guide's list of resources and references. Its CEO, Richard Besser, was the acting CDC director at the start of Barack Obama's first term. When Americans are told to follow the science, they aren't just being told to socially distance. They're being told to adopt the values of an activist class, class and the democratic donors who power it. I agree. This is what I see. And who are these? Well, speaking of democratic donors and people who power it, <laughs> let, me, let me move over here and, and show you a tweet from my favorite alleged conservative and alleged Republican. She's featured on this show before. Ms. Jennifer Rubin, who writes for The Washington Post. Amazing. Up here on the screen is a recent tweet. You know, we've been talking about the bifurcation of our citizenry into two classes, the vaccinated and the unvaccinated, or the clean and the unclean which is being pushed on us at every level of government from the president on downward. We've talked and shown examples of the bloodthirstiness that people who believe that this pandemic is the worst thing to ever happen express toward people who refuse to get the vaccine or people who are hesitant or who have questions and say, I'm not going to get the vaccine until I get the data that convinces me that it's medically right for me and that the cost benefit analysis works out in my favor. They are, well, they're more than bloodthirsty. They are gleeful about it. You know, Jimmy Kimmel last week on his um, late night show made a joke about the thousands of people he believes are going to die in Florida of COVID because they won't take the vaccines. And he thought that was a fine and dandy thing. I can't remember the uh, exact words. You can look it up. There's clips of it online. And he made this joke, which is basically taking delight in, in the prospect they're going to die. They're going to die. Let them die. And the audience was whooping and cheering for it. Here's another example from Jennifer Rubin. 
poor Kevin, who's sitting in the control room, who has to put up my graphics and take them back down because I go off on digressions. <laughs> so she puts up a poll on Twitter with three choices. I don't understand all three of them, but there's really only one that we need to understand here. So Jennifer Rubin puts up a poll that says, what are the best consequences of vaccine mandates? Here are the choices. Nuts quit their jobs. It's a 70-30 issue. Or ours, I, I believe that's Republicans, ours find OSHA's 50-year plus. I don't really understand what she means by those second two choices. But I do understand what she means by choice one. Nuts quit their jobs. People aren't quitting their jobs for being unvaccinated. They are being fired. They are being forced out, or as the legal profession describes it, they are being constructively discharged. Constructively in legal parlance means you don't take an action directly and outright. You try to give yourself plausible deniability. So you create a set of circumstances that make a situation so unbearable that your desired outcome happens as a result of those circumstances piling up. So you shun your employees or you dun them with the requirement to pay for multiple expensive weekly COVID tests. You do everything you can to make it impossible for them to continue working for you unless they buckle under to getting this vaccine. She loves this. She thinks this is great. The best consequences of vaccine mandates, nuts quit their jobs. What she really means is people I dislike get fired and they can't get hired anywhere else. Because she's a wicked person. She's not somebody who just disagrees with people like me politically. She doesn't have a different point of view. She's a wicked woman. She's a bad person. She's beyond doctrinaire. She is sadistic. She likes control. She likes the fact that right now she is a member of the controlling upper class that can shit on working class people, can shit on right wing people and can shit on ordinary workers who don't have the power to fight back against the government and what businesses are doing right now. And she's got an audience. She's got the Washington goddamn post running her as a featured columnist. She's got approval, she's got all the approval she needs. And this is what she does with it. And tens of thousands of people on Twitter click that like button and contribute their own sadistic glee at people they've known who've been fired. <sighs> Got another picture to show you before we take a, a couple more, actually. <laughs> okay, so we know that New York City is one of those cities that is going for vaccine mandates in order to participate in public life. It's another example of the way an abuser talks to you, the way an abuser takes something from you that is yours, that is not theirs to give, it's something that belongs to you. They take it from you and then they sell it back to you under conditions of extortion and they call it giving you a gift, right? Take a look at this. <clears throat> this tweet from the city of New York's Twitter account. It's got a picture of the New York City skyline and a seagull in mid-flight as if to suggest, you know, lovely freedom. And the text over this image of the skyline is get vaccinated or miss out on New York City. And here's the text that accompanied it. The key to New York City is in full effect today. That means when you go to an indoor restaurant, bar, entertainment venue, or gym in New York City, you know that you're in the company of vaccinated people. This is how we keep our cities safe. You know you're in the company of vaccinated people. I'm still shell-shocked that this has become normal because 
you know that you're in the company of clean people. You know that you're in the company of fellow adherents. You're not among the polluted and the unclean. You're so brazen about it. There's going to be more of this. One other little couple of things I pulled from social media illustrate more of this. Last week, of course, we recorded the show on September 11th, and it came out the next day, and I, I shared with you some of my thoughts on September 11th and the aftermath. And I was watching the reaction that came from other people, as I always do. And this one really stuck out to me. This is a young woman named Alexandra Villasenor. She looks like she's maybe 22 years old. I didn't know who she was. She's apparently a climate activist, um, appears to be a devotee of Greta Thunberg. And this is what she had to say about September 11th. Today confuses me. We memorialize an event that happened five years before I was born, resulting in 3,000 deaths and lifelong prejudice prejudices against Muslims while there's no memorializing our 660,000 COVID deaths and little prejudice against those exposing and infecting others. Please tell me why. <laughs> oh, I'll tell you why, you little psychopath. Allegedly, I don't know, just guessing. This has got everything, right? This has got narcissism, the self-regard of youth who doesn't think that anything before she was born is important. False claims of huge societal oppression and abuse of people that is not happening and did not happen. And then disappointed pining that abuse is not being directed toward people that she thinks should be abused. We memorialize an event that happened five years before I was born. Who the hell do you think you are, Alexandra? Do you think the entire world sits there and says, let's not talk about anything before Alexandra Villasenor was born. She won't like that. So what world are you living? I don't need to ask that question. I know what world you're living in. I can guess exactly what world your parents created for you that made you turn out this way and the people you, you spend your time with now. You get applauded for this behavior. Then she talks about how she's upset about lifelong prejudices against Muslims coming from 9-11. No. Some of that, sure. Yes, there was some racism. Yes, there were people who reacted badly. That always happens in situations like this. But Islamophobia and anti-Muslim prejudice did not sweep this country after 9-11. It did not become a systemic barrier for all Muslims everywhere. I know that we have been told that repeatedly by every network news anchor and every opinion columnist in mainstream media for 20 years, but it is not true. And there are Muslims out there and Muslim immigrants who are saying this and have been trying to say it for 20 years. I see them. I see their Instagram. I see their social media. I see their blogs. And people will not listen to them. They won't publish them. They are not featured on MSNBC because they are called traitors to their own race. But then to say, but there's little prejudice against those exposing and infecting others, the unclean, the unvaccinated. What about all the people who are vaccinated and who are getting COVID right now and appear to be passing it to other people? Nope, nope, we just have to. <sighs> I swear to God. Well, it isn't surprising. And again, I've told you before about my list of tells about people, how they present themselves, the kind of photographs that they take and that they choose uh, to present their image to the world. And these things by themselves can't tell you about a person's personality. They, they can be potential indicators. You have to add them up in your head. You have to take them against the context and the pattern over time. But I wasn't surprised to find her publicity photo. Let's put it up on the screen. 
This is Alexandra Villasenor, and if you can't see her, she's standing with one shoulder jutting toward the camera, a hand on her hip with her head turned around. She's in a sort of jaunty pose, and she's got this great big toothy smile right in the camera. It's, it's just self-worship. Look at me. Aren't I just something? Look at me. Well, I don't want to look at you, Alexandra. I don't, and I don't want my viewers to have to anymore. So Kevin, remove that woman from our screen. <laughs> We're coming up on a break here. Um, but I want to remind you to subscribe to us if you're interested in the video version. Um, you know that we're having problems with YouTube. You know that our show from two weeks ago was banned from YouTube. Surprisingly, last week I really went for YouTube and they didn't take it down. Um, so I don't know what's going on there. But, but we are also on free speech platforms and one of the best is Odyssey. So look for us on Odyssey. Please do a backup. Don't just subscribe to us on YouTube. Go to odyssey.com forward slash at disaffected and hit the subscribe button so you can stay with us even if YouTube takes us down. After the break, we're going to be joined by my friend Christopher Aaron Felker, who lives here in Burlington and is the communications director for the GOP of Chittenden County. And he's going to talk to us about an interesting run in he had with local media. So join us on the other side of the break. For more conversation on the dark and disordered psychology that shapes today's cultural and political left, subscribe to our weekly audio podcast on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Google Podcasts, and virtually anywhere else you get your podcasts. Let's learn to recognize these dynamics and call them what they are. Subscribe to Disaffected to learn how to break the spell. Welcome back. So we've got some local politics to talk about here that have to do with issues that we talk about on this show that are nationwide. So recently, we had here in Burlington, Vermont, an interesting situation with one of our local media channels, WCAX, uh, which is uh, a network news affiliate, local television station. and. Let's see, what's the best way to bring you into this? This all starts with a suspect who is wanted for various crimes, various allegations of crimes. Let's put this up on the screen here. So this is a screenshot from actually my NBC5. The man named Matthew Cagle, who is well known to local police. Let me give you a little bit from their news story to set this up for you. So, Burlington police are searching for a man accused of assaulting a traffic guard and evading police, the latest in a series of encounters with officers this year. In a press release, investigators said 33-year-old Matthew Cagle was stopped in traffic Wednesday when he yelled at a flagger guiding traffic and drove to a nearby supermarket. Police said Cagle then returned to the construction site, becoming verbally aggressive and slapping the flagger. When another employee tried to step in, investigators said Cagle attempted to punch them. He's also accused of brandishing a hunting knife and threatening to stab both construction employees. Now let's turn to our state, one of our alternative media platforms here in Vermont, Vermont Digger, to get to the next part of this story. In a related story, an online comment by former city council candidate Christopher Aaron Felker blaming state's attorney Sarah George, state's attorney is our word for uh, district attorney, for failing to incarcerate violent suspects was dropped from the WCAX website. George, that is Sarah George, state's attorney, has a well-publicized policy of preferring mental health counseling and community services over incarcerating some repeat violent offenders. Today, September 7th, WCAX News Director explained why Christopher Aaron Felker's comments were dropped. Quote, Mr. Felker's comments were blocked because they included links, which is a violation of our commenting policy, he wrote in an email to Vermont Daily Chronicle. 
When the story first broke last week, Garrity said he was unaware of the reason, but promised to investigate and inform us. Let's take a look at the comment that WCAX took down, the comment by Christopher Aaron Felker. It's up on the screen here. And actually, I'm going to read my... When I'm looking down like this, folks, I've got a monitor in front of me. It's not right in front of the camera. That's why I'm not looking at you, and I'm going to read it from there. Because I don't think even my borderline glasses are strong enough for the small type on my piece of paper here. So this is what Christopher Aaron wrote on WCX's Facebook page. One month ago, this man was charged with a violent, racially motivated assault in Battery Park that left the victim unconscious. Chittenden County residents deserve a state's attorney that cares enough about public safety to keep people like this off our streets. Sarah George's failures as state's attorney continue to place Vermonters at risk. And apparently the offending part of this tweet, not tweet, um, this comment, this Facebook comment, was the fact that Christopher, in frankly journalistic fashion, backed up his claims by putting a link to the Vermont Digger story that I just quoted uh, from to you. And that was taken down by a news station from its Facebook page. Well, Chris Ferrin wanted to know why, so he wrote to WCAX. <laughs> and here's what news director Roger Garrity said. Hi, Christopher. I was able to circle <laughs> sorry I can't <laughs> circle back he's got Pisaki disease. I was able to circle back with my team this morning. The reason your comments were disallowed is because they included attachments which violate our commenting policy. Uh, Christopher wrote back and said, "Wrong. There were no attachments, only links to other stories." This exchange went back and forth for a little while. Um, but I think it would be more interesting to hear straight from the source's mouth. So we are going to bring Christopher Aaron Felker in himself and uh, let him tell you the rest of the story. Hello, Christopher. Good afternoon, Josh. Okay. And here's the interesting behind the scenes stuff, folks. First of all, Christopher Aaron and I are friends in real life. Um, and he's actually sitting in the other room <laughs> behind me. And the only reason we're not sitting here talking to each other on camera is because uh, there's not enough room here to get us both in, in this tiny little studio. So um, <laughs> we're pretending it's satellite link. Christopher, thank you for joining us. Um, what was, what impression were you left with? I know that when you first saw that your comment had been taken down, you were puzzled by this, and I was puzzled by it too. After speaking to Mr. Garrity, what do you think about all this? What's going on here? Is it really about links, attachments? You know, it's it's difficult to say, Josh. Uh, it was, um, it was a little shocking when I first realized that the comment had been taken down. Uh, it had garnered nine likes rather quickly, uh, came back to it a little, a few hours later and it had been removed. At which point I reposted the original comment with the same citation and, uh, and went back up along my day. Uh, later that evening, it was still there, but by morning time, it had been taken down a second time. And not only was it removed, but the WCAX staff had cited them as spam. Oh, does that mean that uh, they reported them as spam so that Facebook thought you were spamming their Facebook page? Yes, that's correct. Lovely. Yes. <laughs> and, and that's what I brought oh, I up to Mr. Go Garrity, that in addition to the fact that I question his censor's motivations in taking down a comment that included a proper citation. The fact that they also left up other comments that had links, memes, GIFs attached to them, not to mention the fact that they had text with comments that explicitly stated, explicitly violated their comment policy on making personal attacks against others. D were you able to detect any, uh, uh, were the, <laughs> let me not be coy, let me come right out and say it. 
I don't know if you feel this way, and if, if you see it differently, uh, please say so. But I wonder if this is viewpoint discrimination rather than what they seem to be relying on, which is saying that our our policy is that we don't have any links. First of all, that's a very strange policy, I think, for a news organization to have, because one of the things that we expect from journalists, but also when we're dealing in a journalistic milieu, if you will, is that you cite your sources, you back up what you're saying, and that's what you did by putting the link in there to to Vermont Digger. It's an act of good faith. You're saying, this is where I got it from. You can look at my source and see if you think you agree or not. Um, so it, I find it a little bit difficult to believe that they have a blanket policy that nobody can put links in there. Does I wonder if this has something to do both them coming after you, but also not removing the personal attacks that other people are making. I wonder if this has something to do with your viewpoint, because what I didn't say to people introducing you is that you are the communications director for the GOP in Chittenden County, which here in Vermont is our most populous urban county. And what, urban does not mean here in Vermont what it means in most places, <laughs> but it certainly is. <laughs> it's our it's our most populous county. What do you think about that? You know, that was the first thing that came to mind, Josh, was that when I noticed my comment had been taken down a second time and scrolling through the comment banks that were there and what was still left up, it did, it was, it was hard not to feel targeted, especially since my viewpoint, the opinion that was expressed was one that was critical over a Democratic elected official. Right. And, you know, I, your point is well taken. I mean, if we go back to, to what this is really all about, according to all the media that I've read, this, this man, Matthew Cagle, has, has been arrested multiple times for acts of violence, threats of violence, um, and, and he's been out on the street most of the time here. That's and correct. I think it's perfectly legitimate for a citizen to say, You've got somebody here who's already demonstrated violence and he's already demonstrated his propensity to violence. Why is he not being prosecuted and locked up? That is something that a public servant like state's attorney Sarah George, that's a question that she should have to face. And I think it's a question that local news media ought to be asking and at the very least ought to be interested in the fact that a citizen is asking it. But they don't seem to be, do they? You're, you're correct. It the media seems to like to push the narrative that the media that the media wants to push, and anybody who who steps aside or offers a, a more critical vantage point of elected officials can have that voice suppressed. It is disappointing. Mr. Cagle has had over 50 encounters with the police so far this year. Sarah George has repeatedly boasted about the ability for her to leverage her prosecutorial discretion to lessen charges against people who have offended. Well, I think it's high time that we have a prosecutor in our state's attorney's office that's willing to leverage that prosecutorial discretion to try and keep people like as dangerous as Mr. Cagle with repeat violent offenses whose victims fear coming forward and testifying against him. It's our state's attorney's responsibility to use that prosecutorial discretion to keep our city safe. Well, I want to draw a connection here to some things that we've talked about on this show recently in other parts of the country. Um, we, we know what's been going on, for example, in cities like Portland, Oregon, where Antifa, anti-fascist, uh, as they like to, to label themselves, but really miscreants um, and violent psychopaths who just want an excuse to, um, to, to wreak havoc wherever they go. They've basically been running that city for a couple of years because the police arrest them and then they're immediately released on bail or on their own recognizance, or they get in front of a judge after you know throwing Molotov cocktails or beating somebody up in the street and they're just immediately released or their charges are dismissed. And I, I said in a recent show that Burlington, if people wanna know what Burlington, Vermont is like, that the politics here make this basically 
a miniature version of Seattle without the violence. But, you know, maybe this is part of that violence. And and I wonder if we're seeing the same thing here with left-leaning politicians, left-leaning public servants, Democrats, who seem to want to position themselves as compassionate to the mentally ill or we don't want to we don't want to incarcerate people too much but what they're actually doing is letting demonstrably violent people stay out on the street and hurt the next person and so much of our conversation i remember when i was a leftist i remember when i was a democrat and i felt very sympathetic to claims and branding that said things like this is not a this is not a prosecutorial matter. This is a mental health matter, right? I was all for the idea that we need to be getting people treatment if they're drug addicts or if they're mentally ill or there's a lot of crossover between these two things. And I think I believe the branding a lot. But, you know, as I've changed my mind politically, what it looks like to me is that people on the left, machine Democrats, like to caricature those of us who have more conservative views on this and say, you guys just worship law and order. You just want to lock people up for the sake of it. And I'm saying, no, we actually want to keep people safe from guys who've already demonstrated to you what they will do to citizens if you don't stop them. You know what I mean? Yeah, and we we do have similar situations here in Burlington. We've had experiences where there was a gentleman who walked into a bar on Main Street, uh, became violent, picked up a chair, threw it across the bar. Uh, the police were called. They issued him a citation. The suspect tore up the citation, uh, threatened the staff of the bar that he was at. And then later that evening, he was up at the top of Church Street Marketplace, and he, with a hammer, started assaulting a, an owner of a restaurant that, lives, that works up the street. So two violent incidences in the same evening. So without a doubt, had that gentleman been arrested and detained after the first incident, that second incident would not have occurred that night. Uh, yes, there tends to be a mental health component to some of these violent encounters, but that's not a trump card to get one out of jail or release one of any kind of liability, and certainly not from the court of public opinion. If somebody's not guilty because of some mental defect, then that is a matter for the judicial system to decide we cannot have people violently attacked on our streets by the mentally ill and still let them continue to terrorize our community. This action requires intervention. We need to have a system of custodial care to ensure that the mentally ill who have violent tendencies can be connected with the treatment that they need. What we do currently is inhumane. It's inhumane to the person experiencing the mental health crisis, and it's inhumane to the victims, and it's inhumane to the community that has to experience this nightmare on a regular basis. Ab absolutely agreed. I'm, I'm gonna go a little further, and I'm gonna be a little bit meaner about this than you are. <laughs> Um, because I don't think a lot of these people, I, I have no idea about Mr. Cagle. I don't know about, I don't know who the other person is, but watching this kind of behavior, which is the kind of behavior that we see in groups of roving gangs like Antifa, I don't see a lot of mental health crises going on here. I think mental health is doing a lot of cover up work for what we ought to be actually suspecting and considering, which is conditions like psychopathy or if you prefer antisocial personality disorder, which is the clinical description of that personality disorder, psychopath, sociopath, antisocial personality disorder, whatever you want. These, this is not a mental illness like schizophrenia, paranoid schizophrenia. These people are not deluded. They're not out of touch with reality. There aren't voices in their head telling them to do this. They are constitutionally violent because they are conscience free 
some of them. They don't care about the effect that they have on other people. The legal system calls this depraved indifference. And they know they can get away with it. This is a very different mindset from somebody who is captured by a delusion that he's, that he's hearing uh, the CIA talking to him through, um, you know, through a filling in his mouth. Uh, again, I don't know any of these people. I don't know what their mental health workup is, but looking around broadly, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I think we are still too, we are still too easily led to being sympathetic and thinking, well, if somebody comes at you with a knife or if somebody comes at you with a hammer, that's a cry for help. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. It's an intent to maim and kill is what it is. It isn't necessarily a crisis. It's I got the opportunity and I'm going to do it. Right. Um, it's, a, it's a real shame because they try to focus the victimhood on the person who is the suspect. And that totally erases yep. the experience of the person who was actually a victim of, of a violent assault. Yeah, it absolutely does. You know, let's let's talk for a couple of minutes about what it's like to live here, um, not being on the left, um, because you and I. Um, well, I mean, you, you know, you're communications director for for the GOP. I'm not a Republican or a libertarian or a Democrat, but I'm certainly more conservative than I used to be. And and my views on a lot of these things are so close to yours that. You know, for for all intents and purposes in some conversations, you know, I'm going to take the conservative point of view. That was not the case when I first moved to Vermont for most of the time that I was here. And you and I met a few years ago. I think it was over a dust up about a gay bar, Mr. Sister. Is that right? Is that when we first got to know each other? I believe it was when we first met, Josh. The, uh, um, the Burlington area was just about to get its first gay bar it's had in about 10 years. And a couple opened up in Winooski, right on the circle. Winooski, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, uh, it's a neighboring sister city next to Burlington. It's, yep. And uh, the, uh, there, were, there were people on the left who objected to the name of the bar which was called Mr. Sister. Which is funny. It is funny. <laughs> you know, it mean, is funny. Uh, it has they been funny. It, I grew it, up it hearing that term. It was transphobic, right? We, we used to say it to each other when I was in my 20s. Uh, it's uh -huh. friendly banter back and forth between other gay men. And um, exactly. it's part of our lexicon. And so it's always been funny. It was and they, they, you know, the the gender LGBTQ plus, well, basically the TQ plus crowd really went after um, the owner of that bar and caused him a lot of trouble and smeared his name in the media and accused him of violence against the trans community. I mean, it was it was a local hometown example of the kinds of nonsense that that I feature on this show from around the country all the time. And, you know. You and I were talking before we started recording today about socializing in and around Burlington and, and what activities you can get involved with. And I was telling you that I don't I don't do much of that around here. I don't have many real life friends, you know, outside of you and a couple of other people Be, because this city is so hard left um, that. You, if you if you are not on the hard left, and God forbid you should have any conservative opinions, particularly here in Chittenden County and around Burlington, you feel like you're walking around keeping your mouth shut, hoping that people don't detect that you're one of them, you know, because we don't have a system. We don't have a social system anymore where people can go to dinner parties or potlucks or barbecues and have differences of political opinion that can be discussed civilly while you're playing a game with each other, while you're having a cocktail with each other. At least that's how I feel. I don't even feel comfortable anymore hanging around with my neighbors. I mean, it's sort of like everybody's drifted apart because everyone who's lived around me, I, you know, I think has progressive politics and it feels very stifling. I think in a, in a more normal, insane time, that wouldn't matter so much, but it seems to matter a lot now. How does it feel to you? 
Uh, well, I'm inclined to agree with you, Josh. It is difficult here in Burlington. Uh, the polarization of people who are hyper political. Uh, some, some of those, some of those people are. They once they realize they disagree with you on something, they stop talking to you. They purposefully ignore you, uh, which is interesting because they're usually the group that goes around saying things like you deny my identity or you deny my existence. Well, no, I personally don't. I say hello to you every time I see you. It's you who acts like I'm not standing next to you. It's you who doesn't return my phone calls or my emails. Um, so it's another example of their hypocrisy. You know, they try to talk about being inclusive, but they tend to be the most exclusionary people I've ever encountered. And I'm right there with you, Josh. It's extremely difficult. Uh, Burlington is one of the most beautiful places I've ever lived in my entire life, physically. We've got the Adirondacks over the view of Lake Champlain. We've got the beautiful green mountains. The views are incredible. The weather is pretty remarkable here. It could be worse, you know. Uh, it, but And it's a, it's a picture. I mean, it's the thing about it, and Burlington is a great example, but this is a this state that we live in is literally a picture postcard. It looks in real life the way the postcards that people have been buying for 80 or 90 years look. It's a Victorian confection, right? The architecture and 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 the towns. It really is. It really is very beautiful. But it's it's well, I mean, look what happened. You know, tell tell people a little bit about what happened when you were running for city council recently. You didn't win. but did you not catch an associate of of your of the council member you were competing against actually stealing your signs, your campaign signs? <laughs> yes, actually, yes. So here tell in us that Bur- story. <laughs> here in Burlington proper, we are a three party city, and in Vermont as a whole, we do have a very strong third party. It's the Vermont Progressive Party, and they are as leftist and Marxist as you would anticipate, and. Um, the ward that I ran for city council in here, in Ward 3 in Burlington, has been held by the Vermont Progressive Party for 40 years. We haven't, as the Burlington GOP hasn't even run a candidate here in 10 years. And so we, uh, we came from nowhere as a surprise. And a lot of, both of my opponents, the Democrats and the Progressives, were shocked and outraged that we would have the audacity to run a candidate who would advocate for conservative values in Burlington. As such, less than 24 hours after my campaign announcement, both of my opponents condemned my entry in the race and said people like me don't have a right to be in Burlington or in politics. Shortly thereafter, the Progressive Party runner-up to the nomination, a uh, Miss Julie Masuga, who only lost the nomination by one vote in the fifth round of ranked choice voting. Miss Masuga stole lawn signs of mine that were um, legally placed here in Burlington. I came across Miss Masuga while I was walking my dogs. She had my sign sticking out of her tote bag. And I I ran up to her and said, excuse me, you have my sign and I'd like it back. And she looked at me with blank stare and said, what sign? I responded, the blue one in your tote bag with my name on it. (laughs) That sign. (laughs) (laughs) She gave it back to me. She didn't know how to respond. Uh, her boyfriend, who was with her at the time, made some snotty comments about picking up trash. And uh, <sighs> I went along my way. She later that day confessed online to remove, to moving the sign, not even removing it, moving it. Like she's going <laughs> to rehome the thing. <laughs> <laughs> 
did she think it was unhoused? <laughs> She's like, oh, <laughs> I'm so concerned that this is going to negatively impact and terrorize the transgender community. It was a lawn sign with my name on it. That's all it was. They are such too, by the way. histrionic drama queens. Drama queen. Oh my God. They're, yep. I mean, the censorship is real in this viewers, town. It seems to be coming from the news sources. It tends to come from community groups who try to silence people who they disagree with. And, you know, we're not expressing any kind of radical views. We entered this race and ran a completely positive campaign based upon finding solutions and commonalities to the shortcomings and the failures of Burlington. Yeah, well, um, you know, you didn't win, but as I've said to you before, I think that the, I think the effort was worth, um, the effort was definitely worth doing. Um, at the very, I don't know how you feel about it, Christopher, but at the very least, um, I think that just you entering the race and refusing to apologize for it and refusing to be baited by their accusations of transphobia or you're giving harm, you just started to get this city a little bit used to what we used to be able to deal with, in, in my view. You know, expect this. You don't own the body politic here. There are going to be people who disagree with you. They are going to enter the political process. You are going to have to accept that. And screaming about how their very presence is harming or doing violence to people is not going to stop them. It's not going to make them drop out. So, you know, I think you did good anyway, and I'm glad you did it. Um, but, but I think that it's going to be, I think it's going to take more. It's going to take more from you. It's going to take more from other people uh, if we're going to get back to some semblance of, of normality. And I, I don't know if we ever are. We have to um, make a presence and maintain a presence. We ran a positive campaign and we made it to the end. We weren't bullied out of the race. And that's something to be proud of. I, I'm truly, truly am proud of the, the campaign that we raged. It was a special election in the middle of summertime at the peak of vacation season. Um, fortunately, the seat that I ran for was only a brief six month term. So coming up again in town meeting day, that seat will be open again. We guarantee that we are going to continue to run candidates in this town because it's about the conversation. No one party has a lock on the political discourse here in town. And as long as we can continue to stand up and proudly advocate for Burlingtonians and proper solutions for this town, the sky's the limit. We'll continue to, to advance and propose solutions that will make us all grow as a community and nobody's going to hold us, shut us out from the conversation on that. Good. I'm glad. I'm also glad that you came in and thank you for spending the time with us on the show today, Christopher. Okay. Thank you so much for having me, Josh. For more conversation on the dark and disordered psychology that shapes today's cultural and political left, subscribe to our weekly audio podcast on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Google Podcasts, and virtually anywhere else you get your podcasts. Let's learn to recognize these dynamics and call them what they are. Subscribe to Disaffected to learn how to break the spell. I made a comment on one of Ms. April's recent videos about PBIS in which I stated that PBIS is white supremacy with the hug, and a lot of y'all wanted to know more about that, so here we go. First of all, thank you to Jack Copa, who um, reminded me that um, Dina Simmons was the first to coin this term. So thank you, Jack, so much. So if PBIS concerns itself with positive behaviors, um, we have to ask ourselves, okay, well, what are those positive behaviors? And it's things like making sure that you're following directions and making sure that you're sitting quietly and you are in your seat and all these things that come from 
white culture. The idea of just sitting quiet and being told stuff and taking things in in a passive stance is not a thing that's in with many cultures. So if we're positively enforcing these behaviors, we are by extension positively enforcing elements of white culture, which therefore keeps whiteness at the center, which is the definition of white supremacy. Really? Is that white supremacy? Is it really? Honest to God. This is where we're at. This is a public school teacher. If you haven't seen some of these, I'm telling you, again, go to the Twitter account, Libs of TikTok. This guy compiles all of this stuff. There are so many public school teachers like this. I mean, first of all, how old is this guy? 22? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> sitting in your seat, taking directions, or in other words, acting like a civilized person uh, and and acting professionally in the way that that we expect children in professional for children. Right. School behavior. Part of the early grades in primary school is socialization. Is teaching children how to behave in groups, how to behave when they're taking instruction. We can have conversations about whether or not schools are too regimented. They may be. Uh, although if this is what public school teachers are doing, I wonder if they're reg regimented enough. What about this is white supremacy? This is actually an insult to non-white children. It's not part of their culture to take direction. It's not part of their culture not to interrupt. It's not part of their culture to pay attention and stay in their seat to behave well. Well, if it isn't part of their culture, then maybe they ought to be learning that in school, huh? You know, there, there's a kernel of truth to this. There, there is a kernel of truth to this. Children who come from single parent homes and of those single parent homes, poverty, lack of parental supervision, lack of wholesome parental instruction correlates very highly with this. It's not everybody. It's not all single parents, but it is a high correlation. They are not taught these values at home. These are values they need to be successful and to be happy and content in their lives. I'm not talking about turning children into automatons or obedient robots. There's, look, everything doesn't have to be an extreme here. But to equate decent behavior and deportment with racism it, it's it's just it's ridiculous. They they are they the wokies the mainstream media what some people call the cathedral they are in fact coming for our children through every channel that we used to think was safe and instructive and wholesome they're coming through public school teachers they're coming through the introduction of racist indoctrination in schools that they call critical race theory through gender theory telling children five six seven eight years old that they may not be a boy they may not be a girl the woke have left nothing that was previously good for children untouched sesame street has gone woke and we know that the muppet universe which is you know closely closely tied in with the Sesame Street universe, if you will, has already gone woke. We, we saw Gonzarella, Gonzo in drag, being the princess in the Cinderella story three or four weeks ago. Check out what Sesame Street put out on social media this week. This is a picture of three Muppets. It looks like a Muppet family. I was going to say mom, dad, and kid, but... I don't want to assume their genders, and I don't want to be exclusionary, so I'm just going to say it's a family. And the big title on this image is, 
<laughs> Celebrating Latinx Heritage Month. <laughs> Excuse me, Latinx. When you need a tissue in Spanish, Latinx. Here's what they say. Latinx Heritage Month is here, and we look forward to celebrating all month long. Together, let's take time to recognize and appreciate the Latinx culture and community that makes our neighborhoods so great. Happy Latinx Heritage Month with a hashtag. Piss off, Sesame Street. Seriously? Screw you. Screw you for screwing up something that was a positive influence in so many children's lives, including mine. When I was a boy, we learned the lessons that Sesame Street claims it's trying to teach today in a normal way. One of the revolutionary things about Sesame Street was that it's setting, you know, Sesame Street in New York City, it was set in Manhattan. It wasn't on a farm. It wasn't an idyllic, romanticized uh, urban, uh, suburban or rural landscape. It, would, it focused on children who lived in cities and who did their socializing on the steps of brownstones with garbage cans right next to them, right? This was working class and urban kids being put into the foreground. And you had people from every nation. You had Luis and Susan you know, some of them were Puerto Rican, some of them were Mexican, some of them were Chinese. You learned about multi-ethnicity, not, yeah, multi-ethnicity, multi-racial living, because it was just presented to you as something normal. And the scenarios that the children were put in where they had to make difficult decisions or when sad things happened to them, were evenly distributed among all the different kinds of kids that they had participating of, of all different skin colors and all different backgrounds. This was the normal way in the late 70s and the early 80s that Sesame Street presented these ideas. And today, we've got them shoehorning woke language in here in this heavy-handed and didactic way. Latinx, how disconnected is Sesame Street? How disconnected is the children's television workshop from the actual children that they think they're trying to serve? Because a recent survey showed that of survey takers, 4% or less of Latinos and Hispanics liked, approved of, or would use the, the word Latinx. This is a magical fetish word that white liberals use over the objections of the people they are describing. They are excluding actual Hispanic people by using a ridiculous ginned up term that none of them use and that does not even work in their language. Spanish is a gendered language, like all Romance languages, and I'm sure some other languages. It has, words have a gender, not a sex, a gender. <clears throat> Latino, Latina, not Latinx. I mean, these people, these Wokies who talk about colonization, this is linguistic colonization. They're doing it. Notice the reversal, project and reverse every time. Ah. Let's move on to an article that I saw in the Was uh, not Washington Post, Wall Street Journal magazine. I'm gonna spend a few minutes on this. I. <laughs> The article was so good, I really, I was sort of tempted to read the whole thing. I can't do that. This is a TV show and a podcast. Um, you can just go read the article. But I'm going to quote from it extensively. Because it's one of the few times I've seen this issue discussed so thoroughly and so directly by a psychologist. And granted, it's the Wall Street Journal, which still leaves room for heterodox opinions, much more so than the New York Times. But, but I think it's progress. <clears throat> So the article is called Gender Transition, an article I didn't want to write. And the author is Ellen Kashak. Um, here we go. I honestly do not want to be writing this article. As a clinical psychologist and a pioneer in gender research and treatment, I would prefer to be discussing the current proliferation and social phenomenon of what is being called gender transition with my colleagues 
attending conferences on the topic, reading research articles. But none of these things is happening. Instead, there is a deafening silence on the part of most individual psychologists and an enthusiastic, unquestioning, and unresearched explosion of support for transgender motives, actions, and people by others. I, too, want to offer my support for human rights, but uninformed and unquestioning support may actually involve harm. So instead, I am asking for psychology to step up and take on its responsibilities in this regard. Good luck, Ellen. Good friggin' luck. Quote, transgenderism has become a social movement and no longer only a personal preference or psychological issue. Those who even dare to question its validity, as I am doing here, are subject to threats, hatred, and abuse in person and on social media. Professors have lost their jobs at some universities. Silencing any discussion in the universities is not to be ignored, but taken as a serious signal of a danger to free speech. More perniciously, their wordplay includes substituting the term gender for the sex change that they are attempting. The reason for this substitution is simply that sex cannot be changed. It is a biological reality rather than a socially constructed idea. Sex is currently immutable. Gender is not. The conflation of these human characteristics can and does lead to confusion at best and irreversible physical damage at worst. This formerly personal psychological issue, which affected only one-tenth of one percent of the population has exploded into a social movement with all the characteristics of social contagion. In elementary and middle schools, groups of friends are transitioning together rather than joining a sorority or fraternity. She's right. And she's right to point out this wordplay, the substitution of the word gender for sex. This has been deliberate. They want to turn them into synonyms. And people disagree on whether sex and gender can be separated. Um, the separation that I tend to use linguistically and conceptually may or may not be the one you use, but it is this one. Sex refers to biological reality. Gender refers to the personality characteristics that we ascribe to having a certain sex, whether we ascribe them correctly or not. When we're doing that, we're talking about a thing that we label gender. Um, I might be convinced to change my mind about that, but that's how I understand it. But they have deliberately mash these two terms together so that they become conceptually cemented in people's minds because the real goal here is not to allow people to have room to play with gender, that is to play with sexual stereotypes, to break them, to say, I'm a man, but I can do these things that are normally associated with being a woman and that doesn't make me less of a man. They don't want that. That's what my generation wanted. They want that to mean and therefore, I'm not a man, I am a woman, and you better goddamn agree and call me a woman, too. <clears throat> a few more from this article. The diagnosis of gender dysphoria actually came into existence as gender identity disorder and replaced the pathologizing of homosexuality, eliminated in 1973, in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. These diagnoses are adopted by popular vote of the American Psychiatric Association members, democratic rather than scientific. They have the strongest investment in construing psychology in terms of health and pathology. The association members had been convinced by lobbying groups and research to vote to normalize homosexuality. In doing so, they wanted to leave a diagnostic possibility for those who remained conflicted about their sexual orientation. Diagnosis permits treatment via the official approval of insurance companies who today control the professions to a frightening extent. Thus was born gender identity, seemingly a harmless and even generous compromise. Well, look at that. <clears throat> And she talks about how proponents of modern transgender activism have hijacked this diagnosis, have hijacked 50 years of feminist theory, turned it on its head, um, and have spurned what we have learned about the fact that, that 
these sex role stereotypes that we now call gender identities can be distributed differently among the sexes and it doesn't doesn't throw your actual sex into question. They've turned it on its head and said, yes, it does in fact do that and therefore you need surgery. So she closes up the article by asking some questions. Here are some important questions. If psychologists and psychiatrists are going to pathologize and diagnose a questionable practice at best, then shouldn't they diagnose carefully as lives depend on it? And here we go, folks. Are they then considering and eliminating such diagnoses as narcissism or sociopathic disorders, sexual fetishes, dissociative disorders, or even delusional disorders? Is transitioning more like self-cutting or eating disorders than like homosexuality? Yes, Ellen, it is. Increasingly, many patients are self-diagnosing a practice not offered by the professions to any other group. She ends this way. The seeds of the next problem are contained in the current solution. I believe that in the not so distant future, we are going to have numerous groups for adult survivors of gender transition, including those who are critically ill from the side effects of a lifetime of hormones, those who are sterile, and those who have related regrets. Treating them may well be the future of a large segment of psychology. Thank you, Ellen Kashak. Thank you. Thank you for sticking your head above the parapet. Thank you for saying what so many of your colleagues and peers should be saying if they were truly following their conscience and the ethical guidelines that they signed up for. But thank you also for making people like me feel a little less lonely. I know I'm not the only person who sees this problem. I know I'm not the only one who has drawn the connection between gender identity and cluster B and delusional disorders. But we act as though people like me and now people like you are this tiny little minority who are in some way crazy themselves. It's, it's good to see somebody in the profession saying it. And I hope that this encourages some of your colleagues to follow suit. <clears throat> well, we haven't talked about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in a while, so why don't we look at a picture of her ass for a second? How do you like that? <laughs> you all have seen this, I know. Um, I wasn't going to do anything about it, but so many people were sending messages saying, I hope you're going to talk about this. I hope you're going to talk about this. We don't know what you think about it. You already know what I think about it. <laughs> you don't need me to tell you. <laughs> you know exactly what I think about it because I think the same thing about it that you think about it. So this week, this past week, the Metropolitan Museum of Art had its annual gala, which is just narcissists on parade. It's where people show up in outlandish I was going to say designer gowns, but they're not even gowns. I mean, some of the, these people are wearing things that look like they're made out of plastic bags uh, that are stapled together and covered over with markers from the Lisa Frank collection. I mean, it just utterly ridiculous. Somebody said it's Halloween uh, for rich narcissists, and it is that, but it's it's just weird. I mean, they don't try to look elegant. They try to look ridiculous. So Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez shows up in what could have been a beautiful fishtail gown. Form-fitting, white, off-the-shoulder gown with a, a fishtail in tulle, right? I love a fishtail gown on a, on, a, on a woman with a good figure. I think, I think it's just so elegant. Uh, but she had to go and screw it up by painting it to look like a Chick-fil-A bag. So on the back of it, in blood-red paint, is the big legend tax the rich and it is on the back and this picture that's on the screen here if you can't see it it's her with her ass facing the camera looking back over her shoulder with that coquettish look on her face and absent absent that ridiculous writing she would have looked beautiful she has a lovely figure she's a pretty woman She's wearing her hair in a chignon. It's very classic. She could have looked just dynamite, but she had to go and histrionic it up. Um, <laughs> well, let's look at our next. Is this a slide here? Do we say slides anymore? Uh, this is an article 
Oh, gosh, I cut off the name of the newspaper. A couple of them carried this. I think this might have been The Independent in the U.K. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez slapped with ex- ethics complaint for accepting free Met Gala tickets. <laughs> These tickets are thirty or $35,000, and I guess the allegation is that she got a free ticket, and that's an, an ethics violation for a congressperson. I don't know all the details of this, but we'll be watching. You know, before... Before we started recording this segment, Kevin and I were talking about this a little bit, Kevin, the producer, and he said, she's not serving her cause very well. She's not actually furthering her political position because all she got was this backlash and pushback. I see it a little differently because I don't think her cause is what she thinks it is and that maybe we think it is. She doesn't care about taxing the rich. First of all, she is the rich now. Now she is the rich. And I don't believe she's big hearted enough that she actually wants to pay more taxes. I don't think she wants to advance that agenda. I think her goal is something different. I think her goal, a lot of it is attention. She's narcissistic and self-regarding and she wants attention. She wants to be seen. She wants to be seen as America's Ava Perone, right? She's here for the desk commissados, the shirtless ones, the poor, the disenfranchised. She wants to be a secular saint. She also, I think, wants an opportunity. She wants the backlash because the backlash allows her to assume the victim pose. And she's very, very good at the victim pose. She's been doing it ever since she got into Congress. She did it after the January 6th uh, demonstrations and break-ins at the Capitol where she told everybody how traumatized she was by it because as a sexual assault survivor, she didn't think she was just going to be killed. She thought other things were going to happen to her. We did a whole episode on this woman back in the beginning of the show. If you're interested, it, uh, the episode title is Histrionics in the House. She got her goal service because that's what she wanted. That's what she wanted. So we'll see where this ethic, ethics complaint goes. Now let's look at uh, another grand dame from the Met Gala. This is New York State legislator Carolyn Maloney. In a photograph that some people have said it's like out of the movie The Hunger Games. Yeah, it is, but it reminds me of some other things too. So she's standing here in a gown that has these long trailing banners off it um, that go off her shoulder and then are spread out along the floor like the train of a monarch's dress that say equal rights for women. I don't know what bloody century she thinks she's in, but it's not the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. But what I wanna point to here is not Carolyn Maloney, but the servants in the background, the line of women clad in all black standing up against the wall, most of them with their hands clasped in front of them, all of them wearing masks. Carolyn Maloney's not wearing a mask. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was not wearing a mask. There's a photo of her getting ready for her debut at the Met Gala and her dressmaker Her servant is kneeling in front of her dress and doing a last minute alteration and she's masked up. You can't see anything but her eyes and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is just sitting out there beaming. This is the Lord and Lady of the Manor. You see this in, in costume dramas. This is what it was like in the days of the old manor house in British society where the Lord and Lady would come home and the servants were all lined up along the hallways while the Lord and Lady walked down and they all had to keep their eyes downcast. Have you noticed that we are making the servant class mask up while those of us elevated nobility don't have to? You see it everywhere. I walk into grocery stores, I walk into restaurants, the staff are all wearing masks, but the patrons don't have to here in Vermont anymore. There's no governor's edict saying that you have to wear it. Well, actually, I don't give a shit, obviously, what the governor's edict is. I'm not going to wear it unless somebody forces me or kicks me out anyway. So I don't really care, but I don't really know what it is. It might be that if you're not vaccinated, you have to to wear a mask, but I'm not going to obey that. But I noticed this and I don't like it. I don't like the class associations with this. 
you know, we, we treat these people, the media talked about them for a long time as key workers and essential workers and how important they were. They kept delivering our food, they kept making our food, they kept cleaning our houses. Oh, what heroes they are. Bullshit. We think of them as servants. This is the serving class. This is the underclass. And that's why they have to wear masks. I don't think it's conscious for most people, but I do think it's, it is a motivation subconsciously. I think we like this. I think we like the fact that we have identified a class of people that we can put our fears onto and say they need to mask up because they're dirty. They're beneath us. They work at McDonald's. Gross. Want to leave you on a positive and slightly humorous note. This woman I'm about to show you is on fire. Her name is Megan McGlover. Her TikTok just got taken down and she thinks it's because she went after President Biden for his dictatorial stance on vaccine mandates. And she may well be right, but we know that these social media companies will shut you down if you question the COVID narrative. So um, this is not a woman who's gonna be shut down though. Um, and I wanna play you this TikTok video from her. Let's roll You know it. what, since everybody has a card, I want a card as well. The drug addicts got a methadone card. These, these jabbed up people got a jab card. I want a healthy immunity card. I wanna, I wanna, I take care of myself and I mind my own fucking business card. Do you have one of those? I think we ought to start putting those into a production immediately because I, it takes a lot of work for me to take care of myself. I, I work out, I, I eat well. This is day 42 of a cleanse I've been on, fruits, vegetables, and water. I haven't had any <clears throat> alcohol, I don't smoke cigarettes. I, you know, so when do I get my card? I, I, want, I want something that I can flash and be proud of and say, look at me, look at me. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Y'all want me to sit up here and stick a whole bunch of foreign shit in my body for what? For what? So you can mess up my DNA? Bitch, please. You ain't gonna have me standing outside in the damn sun turning green and shit. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> yes, testify, sister. Thank you. I was gonna end that, but I screwed up something and I'm gonna end with this. Oh, she just, she gives me good vibrations. Thank you for listening to another episode of the show. And if you like what we do, will you please support us? This costs money and we really appreciate the financial support. It's gonna help us to expand the show and it's gonna help us get paid for our time a little bit that we, that we put into this between our day jobs. Um, if you like what you see and you wanna kick us a couple bucks or a couple kroner, we'd be really grateful. There's a couple ways to do it. And you don't have to remember these. You always remember our website, disaffected.fm, all the links to financially support us and to subscribe on all video and media uh, platforms are on there. But the main ways are Subscribestar and Patreon. So for Patreon, go to patreon.com slash disaffected. And for Subscribestar, go to subscribestar.com slash disaffected. One of the things you get as a supporter of the show is we have a monthly Zoom meeting uh, just for financial supporters where we all hang out with each other and we talk about what you want to talk about. So thanks very much. That's the show. We'll see you next week. And on the dark and disordered psychology that shapes today's cultural and political left. Subscribe to our weekly audio podcast on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Google Podcasts, and virtually anywhere else you get your podcasts. Let's learn to recognize these dynamics and call them what they are. Subscribe to Disaffected to learn how to break the spell.